Hey folks, this is Will. I'm here to talk a little bit about leadership styles and particularly three that I think are really important to being an effective engineering leader. Kind of leading with conviction, leading with consensus, and leading with policy. CTO at Carta, prior to CTO at Calm, done a bunch of other things before that, and also written a handful of books, most recently Engineering Executives Primer worth, worth reading. And the first job I had out of college was, you know, not, not writing software, but actually teaching English in Japan as part of the, the JET program. So Japanese exchange teaching. Basically take a bunch of 21 year olds, um, throw them into a classroom in Japan to teach English and you know, English speaking culture, sometimes from New Zealand or Australia, the US, the UK, you know, why not? And one of the things they taught us was this culture shock curve. And so, you know, most of the people that were teaching in Japan had never, never been outside of the country before, or just like short trips. They certainly never been working outside of the country before. And so they didn't know what to expect. And this helped us understand kind of the, the year we were in for. And so there's this honeymoon period. We feel really, really good. And then after, you know, two, three months, often people started to feel really bad. They, they were upset about everything that was different around them. And it wasn't like where they grew up. I don't know what they're used to, and they were really frustrated. Then, you know, slowly but surely kind of dig out, start to adjust, and finally get to this adaptation stage where you're basically as happy as you were before, before you came to new culture. But what I noticed is like a lot of folks went through this and had a great experience, but some folks did not ever get out of kind of the, the bottom of the curve. Some people hated it and were frustrated and just stayed there. Those, those, were, those were not happy campers. And I've been thinking a lot about that culture shock curve as I've been talking to more and more managers and, you know, le leading myself over the past four years. I think for, for someone who came up as a manager in that 2012 to, to 2020 period, things were feeling pretty good for a lot of that. And part of that was like the zero interest rate policy that was putting more and more money into startups where there was like less and less friction around like, how do we get enough money? Hey, just, just raise more. It's, it's easy. Um, but also there's like this real idea that the goal of managers in that era was to support their team, to promote career development, how to get your team excited and happy. There's this idea of kind of the, the shit umbrella manager, and your, your job was to protect the team from the company, distracting the team from doing useful things. And that was kind of what the, the era was. And hey, you hit 2020, and, and things have really shifted since. Um, first, you know, there was like the boom of overhiring, then, you know, kind of the, the layoffs to kind of reduce expenses back. Um, but even now, things are, things are just pretty different. And the expectations of what we want from leadership, the different leadership styles that we think are representative of a, a great leader, these are really shifted. And similar to the culture shock curve that I saw in the JET program, some people have been like, oh, man, I love the old model, had a really rough time, then popped out, kind of figured out the, the new way to succeed. Some people are, are still pissed and um, you know convinced that the, the, the last decade was the right decade and the new decade is just misguided. And I want to talk a little bit about um, what that means and, and how to, how to like move forward if, if someone that is, you work with is, is stuck there or maybe that you in some ways feel a little bit stuck yourself and feel like this new moment is, is like bad and that we used to have like good leadership and now it's an era of bad leadership heard that a lot, although not, not everyone wants to kind of say it, say it out loud. So the core hypothesis I have is that for folks who are stuck in the bottom of that, um, most of them are missing at least one core leadership style. And I think there's three leadership styles you need to be pretty effective as an engineer leader. You need to lead with conviction, lead with consensus, and then lead with, with policy. Now I'll talk through all three. Oh, so the corollary, I think these things are, are learnable, not innate. <clears throat> yeah, and I think it's easy to convince yourself that these are innate to who you are. You can't learn that it's conviction style because it feels alien or wrong or consensus is, is slow and dumb. You don't need to learn that. But hey, I actually think all of these are learnable. And as someone who came in with like none of these leadership styles, I've been able to systematically build them over time. I think you can too. And so can someone on your team who sees them struggling with these. So I want to talk a little bit about these three styles, give some examples of success and failure that I've personally run into with all three styles and talk about how to develop them if you or someone you work with is, is missing one of the, the three. 
So there are basically three different styles here, right? Top to bottom. So leading with conviction, and this is when you personally decide to um, make the decisions and, and manage execution on these critical or ambiguous problems. I think for the past decade, you were told that this sort of leadership is bad leadership, but I actually think it's, it's a necessary skill. And I've been using more of it over the last four years than I did the prior um, decade um, combined and really important for decisions when there, there's just no way to use the other, the other kind of approaches. So deciding to add new programming languages, you're gonna really piss off um, you know, your dev tooling team or your infrastructure team, but hey, maybe you just did like a new acquisition who only works in that new language. And there's no way to kind of get to the bottom of that other than building um, an informed perspective yourself and making, making that choice. Then leading with policy, particularly relevant when your company is growing quickly, you're trying to go from a spot where you can just rely on one or two people who have all the context making great decisions to figuring out how you consistently make the same decisions across a much larger population of folks that need to make choices. Think quarterly planning, hiring, um, promotions. These are all cases that this kind of leading with policy comes up quite, quite a bit. And finally, leading with consensus. I think as leaders, we, we generally don't want to put our teams in spots where they have to lead with consensus. But often we um, have to look around and say like, hey, hey, you report to the CEO or you report to the CTO. And they're not necessarily going to lead with conviction on every, every problem. They just don't have enough time to, even if you want them to. And sometimes they're gonna put you in spots where you have to make the choice of either not making progress at all or building consensus with a group who maybe really doesn't wanna build consensus. Um, and you have to be able to do that. Otherwise, you're just you're just dependent on the, the executive to, to do it, and then you're not really a leader. You are just an extension of another leader, which you know you can get pretty far with. But again, to be a flexible, um, powerful leader that can work in many different situations, you need to have this one as well. So leading with conviction, um, this is when um, there's you know stakeholders that can't possibly align. There's a ton of ambiguity, and people just get stuck. And the, the pattern here is basically to go really deep on the context, to educate yourself, maybe talking to customers and internal stakeholders who, who know a lot, um, test the decision widely and, and test both with like peers outside of the company, test with stakeholders internally, and also find ways to actually like try the, the decision and see if it works. Um, then communicate what you've decided and then push, push, push through the friction. And, and anytime you're leading with conviction, there's gonna be a reason you're doing it versus something else, and it's usually that there's gonna be friction. So you have to get comfortable pushing through even when it's, it's a little bit messy. So I think a, a great example of leading with conviction is some work that I've been doing recently with a, a team at Carta. And there was one of our business units where there was a perception that the quality of the engineering work we were doing wasn't that high. And so there's all these like, easy narratives that come out when quality is not high. It's like, hey, the team doesn't care about the work we're doing. It's like, oh, the team is sloppy. Oh, the product managers aren't giving us clear enough specifications for, for the, the, the work to be done. So you start with like, all these different ideas. And there's really, in this case, there was no way to like, figure out what to do. Um, no, no, one would have, no one even agreed on the diagnosis of what was going wrong, let alone the solution to it. Um, and so as we started kind of trying to understand this perception that the quality wasn't that high on some of our work, um, started digging in. One of the first ones was like, hey, maybe we don't know how to test our code. And so one of the first hypotheses was like, we need to roll out more uniform testing standards. And, and as we kind of explored that idea, we did find that um, on the front end, our, our testing kind of patterns were, were a little bit like underdeveloped. And so we could do a little bit more work there but it really didn't explain the general observation. And so we had to keep finding like theses and then like testing them. And then like, you know, a lot of those theses kept falling away. And where we ended up, um, which is not at all where I expected to end up, was this observation that um, our biggest problem was, was likely our release philosophy. And so we were releasing to um, venture capital and private equity funds who are all um, extremely heterogeneous. They're, they, they're almost nothing in common across the entire population, little pockets do. And as we tried to release to all of them, we, we would consistently run into incredibly nuanced errors. Um, so we had to rethink how we deployed and new functionality and kind of deploying to a small cohort, validating the error, and then cohort by cohort building up to the entire population over time. And it wasn't that we were sloppy, 
wasn't that our software didn't work, it's that it worked really well for certain pockets, but not the entirety. And the, there was no like uniform, consistent kind of thing it needed to solve. We had to like roll pocket by pocket out to validate, expand across con relatively homogeneous groups within the, the, the broader heterogeneous population. And this has really impacted our, our quality, and we would have never gotten to this conclusion if we had not had the kind of desire to dig in deep and continue to iterate through hypotheses, even if some of them were, were wrong. And so this is interesting, because I tried to do something pretty similar at my, at my last job at, at Calm, and it didn't go very well. And so it's interesting to compare and contrast. So as I went into Calm, I realized there was no agreement about how we should test functionality, and so I was leaving some bugs kind of escaping through. And I, I had like a clear point of view about where we did which types of tests. Um, pulled together a group, gave them my, my desired approach, tasked them with it, came back a couple months later, and nothing had happened. Kind of the different stakeholders of the group had disagreed. And so they wrote like a memo that was extremely, um, you know, the lowest common denominator. It didn't really change anything. And it never went anywhere. And so the, you know, the, the comparison point is I, I had a clear thesis, I handed it down to the team, but I, I didn't actually put myself in that weekly meeting where we're like driving execution, looking for disagreement, finding kind of the blockers and pushing through. And so that success and, and failure in this case really came down to not just having the big brain idea, but being in the, the weekly meetings where we actually got from big idea to the details coming together. And I think what I learned particularly in the card example is that the big idea was, was you know, inevitably wrong and it's only got refined into something good in the weekly work that, that we went through. So second um, kind of approach, leading with policy. And this is again, when you're trying to get um, many different individuals to make generally the same type of decision across your organization. Um, and, and the process here, you know, look at a recurring decision that's happening a lot already, document how it's made, um, roll out the policy to folks, and then crucially figure out the enforcement mechanisms that actually cause the policy to get used rather than just be a document that kind of sits there. So I think a success story on this is candidate review at Stripe. So when Stripe was small, like every hiring decision was getting made by, by Patrick, the CEO. Then as things scaled a little bit, we, we step, kept, continued to have like, this process where the, the CEO made every hiring decision but eventually it just got to be too much. And so we rolled out candidate review for engineering and a few, a few different functions. But within engineering, basically how it worked, like every every week they had three meetings, had a group of like four, four or five rotating folks, including like a senior leader or the CTO, and one of our, our senior recruiters on engineering, plus like two or three other kind of mid-level engineering leaders as well. And we just talked through each of the packets and we'd give feedback and we'd kind of approve, thumbs up, thumbs down, or hey, you need to, to provide additional context on it. And we always had someone who, you know, two, two people really, who could escalate decisions when something went a little bit wrong with the group. So if, if thing, we got to the seemingly wrong decision, either the senior engineering leader referring to CTO or the recruiter or, or, or both, if they disagreed on a given topic, could escalate up their reporting chains, make sure that we got a little bit more like oversight into the decision. This wasn't perfect, but it worked It worked pretty well. Um, then looking at the failure mode at, at Stripe again, um, we, um, the, one of the engineering leads um, decided to roll out Agile, got kind of this mandate from, from the head of engineering at the time. Um, and, you know, we, they wrote up a document, communicated to all of engineering that we were an Agile shop, capital A. And, and that was it. And everyone at this meeting was like a little bit confused, like, hey, I guess we can do Agile. And, and that was the end of it. There was nothing more. There was no follow-up. There was no review. There was no discussion. There was no training. And so this went nowhere. And the, the policy was actually total, totally reasonable. But the, the real difference between these two is like the, the first one, we had like these enforcement mechanisms where we actually looked at, you know, week by week, was it getting implemented? who had experienced folks kind of helping drive consistency of the approach. And we had escalation mechanisms or when we got it wrong to, to get to the right people to come in and inspect the, the error and, and make sure it got fixed. Second one, good document, but, but no follow through, no enforcement mechanism. So it didn't actually go anywhere, pure, pure optics. Then finally, like working with consensus. So this is really useful when there, there are, you know, the first example, there's, you know, you have this um, engaged executive who can actually like drive a decision. 
Sometimes you need to make a decision, but there is no engaged executive to, to actually do it. What do you do then? And it's, it's developing consensus, right? And so the, the playbook here, you look for a missing decision that would really facilitate moving faster. Then you try to decide if you can just not do this work because the consensus is a little bit slow, takes a fair amount of energy to, to build. You really look for the decision maker if, if you can't, um, if you can't convince yourself to, to skip making the decision. And then if you just can't find the decision maker or they're not engaged, can't prioritize the work, then you form a decision making group and lead that through. And I, you know, don't love this, but it's, it's been most of the successful work I've done on executive teams have, has really been consensus building and leading through consensus. If the CEO had a clear point of view on a given decision, they would have already told you what they wanted and driven the consensus that way or driven conviction um, to a decision that way. But in this case, they, they clearly don't think it's that important relative to their other work. So they're not working on it. The only way then for you to make progress on it is, is through consensus. So again, a couple, a couple examples. I think one of the theme composition in Uber is still one of the things I'm, I'm proudest of that, that I've worked on. And in part, I'm really proud of it because we had no top-down mandate to, to do this. There was you know, general support for it, but hey, there wasn't this perspective that decomposition was obviously going to be the path forward. And we couldn't force people to move out of their, their current services. Um, we could just like tell them what was there. And so instead of looking at this, hey, we're gonna force you, we looked at like, what could we do to incentivize people to kind of get aligned with us? And we made provisioning services really, really, really easy. And then we educated folks, like even in onboarding, like each person who came into Uber and engineering did a service provisioning just to see how easy it was. And then we, we got people to opt in and we couldn't force them to, but we, we could make it so easy that people came to us. Um, eventually there was a mandate from one of the engineering directors, um, but again, we, we didn't force him to do it. We couldn't force him to do it. We just made it so obvious to him that this was an easy path forward for him and his team that he made the decision kind of drove the, the, the customers to us. And we were able to change, I think one of the, the most important parts of the company's architecture without any sort of top-down mandate, which is, which is pretty remarkable. Then on the flip side of consensus was we, we did a, a layoff at Calm and we, you know, as an executive team, couldn't agree on where the cuts needed to come from. And so the, the chief product officer and I um, had a perspective that we should start from looking at comparable companies looking by function like GNA, FNM, R&D, and the, the growth rate for our company, and what are the target spends we should have, and then use that to kind of anchor each of those functions to the, to the right amount of spend, and then cut within those functions to get there. Um, but you know, some of the functions that were a little bit outsized in their spend um, didn't, didn't like that idea, and so we, we weren't actually able to get consensus. And so we ended up with a spot where people were just kind of invisibly escalating to the CEO instead of actually the, having the executive team work together to get the business to, to the right place. And so this this was like a little bit, of, I think a, a lost opportunity where if we could have just aligned a little bit more on what we were trying to do, I think we could have come up with a, a much better series of decisions. Instead, it was just you know a little bit of a, of a mess. And again, looking at these two different differences, I think on the first one, we really focused on getting like the, the clean path to align incentives of the different stakeholders. We, we couldn't, we couldn't force it, but if we made the incentives so easy, um, then people could come along with us. And the second one, we, we just couldn't get the incentives to work. And so ultimately we, we weren't able to drive any sort of aligned decision. We just kind of got stuck and then had to wait for the CEO to kind of dig us out of, of the mess. And so looking at these three different styles, um, if you want to figure out if you're using them, like the biggest advice I have to you or to someone on your team that could work on this is to just look at um, the next five hard problems you work on and write down like what style did you actually use to work on them? Maybe consensus, maybe working with conviction, maybe maybe policy, but just write down like what is like your, your go-to like, strategy for these types of problems. And then, you know, once a month, um, when you take up a problem, don't use your default. And, and try to use a style that's actually appropriate to the problem. But if, if you're so comfortable with one pro, uh, pr approach, you, you might just lean on it for everything. And the key thing is pick something uncomfortable. Sometimes you cannot let yourself just do what's comfortable. You'll continue to be you know, stuck in, in that kind of policy and that, that leadership style, rather than expanding what, what you're capable of doing. Over time, you'll get a lot better. 
And that's it. So really appreciate y'all um, listening and thank you so much.